Before we get into today's video, I did want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance in hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week. Welcome to April. Did anybody get a good April Fool's Day joke pulled on them? If they did or if they pulled one, let us know in the comments section down below so we can read them and laugh along with you. If you guys don't already know, I have a second channel, which is Casually Christina, more laid back casual vibe over there you know just random stuff i also have a patreon my patreon is for 18 and up over there we go live we do personal story times over there we have a two dollar tier where we do true crime stuff that can't go on youtube due to their terms and policies and then i also have an instagram as well as a facebook and those are always linked down in the description box if you'd like to come and check me out. Before we go any further, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. If you are using the internet without ExpressVPN, that is basically the same thing as going to a public restroom, kicking the door wide on open, and letting every stranger walk in and see you do your personal business. See, there are actual hackers that are scouring the internet at all times of every single day looking for data to steal. These hackers will then take this data and your personal information and sell it for many different reasons. But if you have ExpressVPN, then your personal and private information will be kept safe. See, ExpressVPN reroutes your network data through an encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. I have to use Wi-Fi for everything I do business related, whether it be my phone, my laptop, my husband is the same way, and my kids have to use the internet for school stuff. So we are always connected to the internet. Then our personal information and data is kept safe. If you want to try ExpressVPN, all you gotta do is click the link in the description box or go to expressvpn.com forward slash Christina Randall, and you can find out how you can get up to three free months today. Yes, just click the link down in the description box or go to expressvpn.com forward slash Christina Randall and find out how you can get three months free today. Thanks again, ExpressVPN. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about Camp Scott. Have y'all ever heard of this story? This was indeed a Patreon request. Shout out to my Patreons. So almost everybody I would have to assume knows about scouting, right? I know my son, this is a photo of him right here, was in scouts himself. And from what I can find, I mean, there's always ups and downs with everything. The concept of it and what we've experienced, scouting is amazing. And what I've learned also with my son being a scout is it doesn't just stop when they're younger. These that join scouting keep these connections all the way up into adulthood and it's really super awesome and if you guys don't know Girl Scouts was like created in 1912 so it's been around over a hundred years they do all kinds of things together it's not just camping knitting and selling those super delicious Girl Scout cookies you guys know what I'm talking about the chocolate ones the ones with the coconut the ones with the peanut butter in the middle Oh, so good. They get me every time they're standing outside of Walmart looking all cute in their little Girl Scout, you know, outfits with their patches. I know I'm not the only one and the whole box is only $5. I'm like, okay, give me four boxes. Just give them to me now because I need them. They do all kinds of stuff together. I mean, they have like different goals that they have to accomplish throughout the year. And a lot of the times it's like they have to build something. They have to community service in some sort of way. It's just really awesome. So I can understand why even back in 1977, like we will be talking about today, parents were super excited to sign their girls up for Girl Scouts. 
So I'm going to do like I always do. I'm going to tell y'all this full story the best of my ability. And this is an unsolved case. And at the end, I'm going to tell you guys who I think done it because I do have an opinion on this one. And I'm going to give you guys all my opinions at the end. So stay to the end if you want to know my opinion. And let's just start at the beginning. In June of 1977, in a town in Oklahoma, a bunch of little girls were so excited to go to Camp Scott. Camp Scott was founded in 1928. It was over 400 acres of wooded area where little scouters would take their camping trips. There was 10 different units where the campers could stay and they would hold up to 140 little cute adorable campers and 30 different staff members. I mean, this was a huge area. And the place that the little scouts would go to was called Cookie Trail and all the little kids knew about it. So you guys gotta understand, so now we're in 1977, right? Camp Scott was founded in 1928. So it had been around over 50 years at this point. You guys following me here, so you think you're a parent, you know, you're getting your little kids ready. And at this time, this was gonna be the Girl Scout. So you're getting your little girls ready and they're getting ready to go off to summer camp at Camp Scott, which had been around for 50 years, right? Nothing had ever happened. Everything's gonna be all good, right? Now, during this trip, this two week trip that everybody was planning, this was gonna be a big deal because it was Camp Scott's 50th anniversary. And all the little girls that were packing and putting their stuff in their backpacks felt honored that they were gonna go to the 50th celebration. But these little girls, and especially their families, and everybody at Oklahoma Girl Scouts did not know that everything was about to change. So we're gonna talk about three little girls in particular today. Lori Farmer, who was eight years old, Michelle Gus, who was nine years old, and Doris Milner, who was 10 years old. Michelle's mom, who said that right before the trip, she hopped into her mom's lap and hugged her, wrapped her arms around her neck, gave her kisses, and said, I'm gonna miss you so much while I'm gone. And her mom said, you're gonna do fine. You're gonna make so many new friends, baby. You're gonna have the best time. She hugged her mom, she was like, but I'm gonna be gone for two weeks. And her mom said, you gotta go. You're gonna have the best time. You're gonna go canoeing. You're gonna tell ghost stories. You're gonna roast marshmallows. And Michelle was so excited, but she reminded her mom to not to forget to water her plants. See, Michelle had all these little plants and she had been taking care of them. And her mother promised her, I will take care of your plants. Go have fun. 10-year-old Doris was a little bit more apprehensive. She lived with her mother and her five-year-old little sister who looked up to her. Doris was very well known at her school because she was a honor roll student and she had won many of academic awards. She was a super smart little girl and a mama's girl and a wonderful big sister. She was so excited to go and meet new friends and have this new experience with the other little Girl Scouts that she had met. She had never been away from her mother and her sister like this. And this was, come on, this is two whole weeks here. She told her mom, I'm excited, but I just don't know if I wanna go. Her mom said, baby, you need to go. And her mom would later say she was trying to encourage her 10 year old daughter, Doris, to be independent. Like you need to go, you need to be independent, have fun. You're gonna have the time of your life. And she kind of pushed her daughter into going, even though she was really kind of having second thoughts. Something creepy happened though, because Doris's little sister said to her mother when Doris got ready to go, mommy, what happens when people die? Doris's mother said that she just kind of told her, you know, they go off and she kind of tried to explain to her daughter the best that she could what happens when people die. And after she explained to her the best way that she could, Doris's mom said that her five-year-old daughter looked up at her and said, yeah, but mommy, everybody's going to die tomorrow. She kind of just shook it off like, you know, whatever, and just went on about her day. Didn't think too much more of it. Then there was eight-year-old Lori. Eight-year-old Lori was the oldest of five siblings. She was her parents' bright and shining star. She was the oldest child. She was the most responsible. She helped out with her little siblings. She was a mama's girl and a daddy's girl. She was super smart. She had bright eyes, and she was actually smart enough to skip a grade. So she was ahead of grade, and she was also the youngest 
in her class. Now with Lori, Lori was in between going to the YMCA summer camp and then going to the Girl Scouts camp. Lori's mother would later say that she pushed her to go to the Girl Scout camp. I mean, Camp Scott had been around for 50 years. I mean, it just seemed so amazing and so awesome. And so she encouraged her daughter to go to this camp. She would later say that she had to live with that decision for the rest of her life. A, a parent of a child who was murdered, the hardest thing for me is to accept that I let her go into that situation. And I will never get over that guilt. On June 13th, all of the parents getting ready to send their children off to camp for the summer, went to the bus, gave all their kids a hug. You got all these little girls around, right? Okay, they're in their little shorts and their little tank tops. They got their backpacks. You got some little girls with their hair and pigtails. They're all giggly and excited. The parents, gleaming with pride, sat back and watched their little girls walk onto the bus, look out the window, wave at their parents, and they waved at them, and they chatted for a bit as the bus drove off. Michelle Hoffman, who was a 15-year-old camp counselor, rode on the bus with the girls. She noticed a couple little girls being shy, and she would go over and talk to them on the ride there and kind of encourage them and, you know, was just keeping the morale going. But most of the girls were super excited to go. When the bus drove up to Camp Scott, where the 410 acres of wooded area is, the girls looked out the window both ways, seeing the trees, seeing the trails, and they were just so excited. All of the girls girls walked off the bus and started to look for where their tents would be. Michelle, the camp counselor, had noticed that Doris was being a little bit shy, so she was talking to her more, and she also decided to put her in a tent that was closer to the bathroom and the kitchen in case she needed anything. And in this tent, which ended up being tent number eight, was supposed to be four little girls, but ended up only being three for the first night. And those three girls would be Doris, Michelle, and Lori, eight, nine, and 10 years old. When the three girls got into the tent, they immediately became friends. They started talking to each other, hugging each other, telling each other like, you know, what they're gonna do. And the other two girls were telling Doris, it's okay, we're gonna have a good time and cheering Doris up. The little girls were bonding and singing songs together. And before you know it, Doris considered the other two little girls her best friends. So it's those three now, and they are all three best friends. Carla Wilhite, another counselor, said that individually they were three of the quietest little kids and their tent was just as loud and lively as the others once they got together. Now let's take it back a little bit less than two months from this camping trip. The counselor's cabin that was there at Camp Scott had been ransacked. Somebody had broken to the cabin, dug through all the stuff, made a mess and actually took the donuts out of a box, which seemed pretty weird. Not only did they take the donuts out of the box, they left a note and it was a really strange note. Inside the note said, we are on a mission to kill three girls in one tent. Super scary, right? But also in the note, it talked about there being aliens and some other random stuff. So later the counselors would say that they thought it was just a joke. I mean, somebody broke into their cabin, made a big mess, took donuts, and then left a note about, you know, killing some girls and aliens. When the director found out about the note, he just took it as a joke too and ended up just throwing the note away into the trash. Now we're gonna bring it back to the night of the three girls being in the tent. The very first night that they were at camp. They went to dinner, they sung songs around the campfire and the placement of the camp, it was a big campfire and then the tents kind of like a U shape around it and then there was more tents spread out with different girls in them. So they sat around the campfire for a while, the little girls hug and sung songs, but then the camp counselors realized that there was a thunderstorm coming as it got dark. So they had all of the girls go to their tents. All the girls ran off, giggling and laughing into their tents, jumping into their little beds, their little cots that they had, and then the storm came. Now, as the storm came, this was around 7 
p.m. on this evening. It was lightning. They said the storm was bad. It was a big storm. However, these tents were very sturdy tents and they were under a lot of trees. So there was no fear of them getting hurt from the storm, but it was enough that they needed to be in their tent. The three little girls pulled out their flashlights, their pencils, their pens, and their papers, and began to write their families. Now, the eerie letter of them all was Doris's. Doris wrote her mother and said that she did not like camp at all, she did not want to stay for two weeks, and that she wanted to be home with her and her little sister. But as the rain poured, you could hear giggling from other tents and little girls being happy and playing and rambunctious, but needing to end their first night at camp. So the counselors told everybody it was time to go to bed, time to get quiet. There was even a couple counselors that said that they were a bit aggravated, you know, because the girls are giggling and screeching and squealing and it's time for them to go to sleep because they have a big day the next day. Eventually, everything gets quiet and everybody goes to sleep. The next morning, a camp counselor on her way to the showers at around 6 a.m. saw something that looked like a sleeping bag over on the ground in the bush. The camp counselor thought that, you know, something must have gotten dropped, you know, there was more luggage or more sleeping bags, and she went over to get it. However, when she went over and looked at the sleeping bag, she was in shock. She saw the lifeless body of Doris. Doris was laying there, dead, half naked, and obviously had been beaten. She ran to go get other camp counselors, and they were doing the best that they could to not disturb any of the other girls as to not to traumatize them. Another one of the camp counselors immediately called 911. They decided to get the other girls and take them into another area and to distract them. They had them playing games at six, seven o'clock in the morning while investigators and cops came billowing in. When the cops came billowing in, that is when they would find two more bodies, three dead little girls in their sleeping bags, the bodies of Doris, Lori, and Michelle. All three of their bodies were left on a trail that was leading towards the showers. They were about 150 yards away from their tent. Investigators would later say that when they went to these sleeping bags, you know, originally they didn't realize how small these little girls were. I mean, you got up there eight, nine, and 10, right? They're sleeping bags. They were, the sleeping bags were basically swallowing them whole and they were tiny. One of the investigators said that when he opened the sleeping bag with little eight-year-old Lori in it, that she looked like she was sleeping. She just, she, she just literally looked like she was sleeping. She had a flashlight that was in between her legs that almost looked like she had fallen asleep with just the flashlight, you know, there as if she needed to get it to go to the bathroom or something. But upon further investigation, it was deemed that Lori and Michelle were beaten to death and Doris was strangled. Two of the girls had been arred and one of the girls had been Sada. It's still unclear which child suffered which. It's like they did not release all the details rightfully so of these baby girls. But what did seem to be clear was that one little girl's lifeless body was treated very different than the other two little girls. Police interviews revealed that several campers and counselors heard eerie noises that night that the three girls were taken, beaten, and then murdered. At 1.30 a.m., multiple people heard weird moaning noises coming from the direction of the girls' tents. There was even somebody that said it was like a grunting, moaning noise. We'll get to that at the end. And that it was strange. One of the camp counselors, who was a new camp counselor, said that she heard some sort of scream or some noise and she came out with her flashlight and she didn't see anything and it was storming. And the other little girls that were in the tent, she said, y'all hush, hush. But that they were used to little girls screeching and squealing from excitement and she just assumed that's what it was. At around 2 a.m., one of the little campers said that she woke up because somebody, a man, had opened their tent and shined a flashlight in her face. She didn't think anything of it neither. She thought maybe it was 
you know, a counselor, a director that was checking on the kids. But at 3 a.m., and the thing that haunts me in my gut and in my heart is that another camper said that they heard a little girl screaming, mama, mama. As you guys can imagine, it was complete chaos. Authorities called all of the parents and said basically that there was an emergency at Camp Scott and that they needed to get down there ASAP and that a couple of the girls had been hurt, but they didn't tell them anything else. And so as you guys can imagine, I mean, the girls hadn't even been gone for 24 hours yet. These parents hopped in their doggone cars and pedal to the metal was skirting down there probably through red lights, through everything, trying to get to their babies, but they were met with yellow tape from the investigators like, stop, hold up, you cannot go any further. These parents were out there in the heat with no water, no nothing, for hours just waiting to find out if their child was okay or even alive at this point. Now the other campers, the other little girls, again, had been taken to another area and were being distracted with games while this Camp Scott, this area had turned into a crime scene. Dogs were brought in to sniff for clues. They found this random flashlight that was off into the grass somewhere that ended up having a single fingerprint on it. They found a bloody footprint that ended up later on being a nine and a half sized male's shoe in the girl's tent. And there was more blood in the tent, but it looked like somebody had smeared it and tried to clean it up, but it had just smeared everywhere. Now, a local landowner reported hearing a quite a bit of traffic on a small road that was running between the camp and his property between 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. on the 13th. A massive manhunt was launched looking for whoever could have done this to these three baby girls. Now you guys can only imagine what it was like for these investigators to finally go and tell the parents. It went something like them bringing all the little girls that were alive and okay to their parents and they didn't know any, they didn't know what had happened either. They just knew that maybe somebody gotten hurt. So they ran to their parents. You could, can you just imagine standing there looking through a crowd of kids waiting to see your kid and seeing all the girls come out and realize you're the parent standing there left without your child. The excruciating pain of that, I can not. So the three families that were left standing for the three little girls were left trying to pick up the pieces of their lives. And also during this time, the investigators were on a hunt to find out who did this. And they didn't have what they felt like was a lot of clues. Like who would come onto this big 410 acre property? Who would do this? This place that they had been doing these camping trips for 50 years now. What about that note? Did it have something to do with everything that was going on? They started looking at the camp counselors. Like, were you guys involved? And you guys got envisioned like, they're one of these camp counselors, some of the 15 year old kids the guilt that these camp counselors felt from those noises that they heard that they just brushed off like the noises that they had heard many of other times before at these camps. As the investigators began to narrow things down and try to figure out who could do this and all of that, they realized that there was an escaped convict that had escaped from the jail a few years prior. He had been on the run for four years and he'd escaped twice already and he was in jail for the R and the attempted of two women. Did all this stuff to them. He put duct tape on their nose, on their eyes, on their mouths to suffocate them. He abused them in that way and he left them to die. However, they did end up making it and told who it was. They arrested this guy. He was in jail being sentenced to 300 and something years and he escaped and now he's on the run. His name was Gene Leroy Hart. And the two women, by the way, that he kidnapped and did this to were pregnant women. And after these three little girls' bodies was found, investigators immediately started hunting for him. They believed like everything seemed the same. You know, they had been, these two pregnant women had been taken, they had been bound, they had been abused, they were attempted to be and then they were left. Same exact situation, so they just truly believed it was him. 10 months after the three little Girl Scouts murders, a tip led the police to a cabin in Cherokee County. 
there, Gene was found and he was arrested. And this was on April 6th of 1978. He was tried for the murders of the little girls, but a jury actually found him not guilty. The reason why they found him not guilty, they would later say that there wasn't enough evidence to prove that he was guilty and actually the prosecution was like super sloppy. Felt like there was a lot of manufactured evidence, a lot of sloppiness in the, in the proceed, old procedure. I'm not saying he's not guilty, but I am saying that the evidence showed he was not one person done by themselves. We all 12 agreed on that, that there was enough evidence to show that it had been more than one person there was rumors that the cops planted evidence against him and he even cried when the not guilty verdict came back. Now you guys remember this is back in 1978. There was no real DNA. And by the way, on these three little girls, there was DNA found. If you know what I mean, there was found on these baby girls. <sighs> Footprints inside and out of the tent were found, but in a different shoe size than Jean had. Jean wore an 11, and remember how I told y'all that there was a nine and a half size footprint of blood in their tent, so it was two totally different feet print. There was, however, at the crime scene, duct tape, that flashlight, ropes, cords that were left behind. When investigators looked into these ropes and cords, they were able to trace it back to a farmer that lived in that town. So they went to this farmer and they're like, hold up, this is your stuff here. He was able to prove that his house had actually been broken into. He voluntarily took a lie detector test or polygraph and passed it. However, it did not stop the media from posting his picture and making it seem like he was involved and he, got really bamboozled by the public and they thought that he was guilty even though it was clear that he had nothing to do with it. And so that was really sad. And that fingerprint that they found on that flashlight did not match Jean's either, which was another reason why he got found not guilty. So at this point, they still cannot figure out who did this. Now investigators, this is the tricky part, investigators and the cops believed it was Jean. When he got found not guilty, they didn't even look for anybody else because they just knew it was him. They're like, why are we going to go and look for somebody else and test somebody else when they knew it was him? This is when things got really confusing though in the community or I guess controversial because a lot of people believed that investigators of the police was setting this guy up. You think Gene Laura Hart killed those girls? No, I do not. Why not? He wasn't that kind of a guy. You just had to know him. And they all said, well, there was rumors in the town that the sheriff had it out for him because he had evaded him for so long. And so, you know, he had done this allegedly to these other women, which he had been found guilty for. The guy, Gene, denied doing it. He said he was innocent, but the two women that he did it to would later, I mean, you can even find interviews with them online. Their faces are blocked out, but they say it was him. There's no doubt about it. They knew everything about him. And get this. This is the part that makes me go, whoa. One of the women described Jean as he was her, said that he was making these weird noises that was like a grunt. It sounded like a bullfrog. It was a weird moaning, grunting noise which then brings you back to the camp counselors who said that they heard weird noises out, like moaning. One of the camp counselors said she thought it was an animal that was out there. <sighs> now there was a lot of rumors in this small town and a lot of people believe that this guy, Gene, was innocent. As a matter of fact, a lot of the community even raised money for his defense and they wanted him to get out. They thought that he was being bamboozled and they thought that a lot of evidence was being planted. Now there's a, so many more layers to this, like when they went and when they found him, they found that he was actually staying right near the campsite where the girls were is where he was hiding out at. When they went to the place where they found Jean, they found women's glasses that had been stolen 
from the campsite from different counselors. So it was like Gene was going back there and stealing these people's stuff. They found women's underwear that he had obviously stolen. And remember what he did to the other two pregnant women. They found rope that seemingly matched the stuff that was found at the crime scene. But then you flip it because Gene says that it was planted on him by the cops and by that sheriff that had it out for him because he escaped the jail. So th things were split. Now, most people believed that Gene was guilty. Most of the evidence po pointed to Gene being guilty, but then you had these other few little things that said it wasn't him, like the nine and a half foot shoe print or the that was found on these girls, it was said that Jean had had a bisectomy, so there couldn't have been that. So it was like, everything made sense. Okay, he's right there by the campsite. Okay, he has glasses in his house that was stolen from the campsite. Okay, he has done this before. The bullfrog or the moaning or the animal moaning type of way or sounds that he made with the other women. But then, so, so it was just a whole bunch of back and forth. Okay, moving on. When he got off, when Gene got off of this and he was found not guilty or he was acquitted of this, he went. He had to go back to jail because he still had an over 300-year sentence to finish for the other two pregnant women. He was not in that jail for long and he was planning on filing an appeal and trying to get out of that 300 years too and he was jogging on the court of the jail and he had a heart attack and boom, he died right there. So a lot of people felt like that was justice served there and even some of the families of the little girls said that that was the justice because they have always believed that it was Jean. Now fast forward to in the 2000s. I've seen conflicting evidence and I'm just going to tell you guys right now, I think, I think Gene did it if the evidence wasn't planted. Now, we always know there's a chance. We also know that the media can spin things if they want to. And so you just kind of don't really know what to believe anymore, right? But if, if, if all of those things were true and all of those things were found, and I tend to believe the first two victims, the pregnant women who described this bull frog making sound, and then the camp counselors who before Gene was even on their radar described this animal moaning and grunting sound, I think that he did do it. I also saw a video where a woman was talking about the DNA. They re-ran the DNA evidence since new technology has come out. Now this is while after Gene has already been dead. Three of the five tests run on material found at the scene matched Hart's DNA, but still, it was not enough to be conclusive. If three came back and were a match, then so far you would have a match. But if one or two of those other locations did not match, then that would turn that match into an exclusion because all you need is one location or one probe to differ for it to be an exclusion. Uh, if there was insufficient information on the other two, that it was inconclusive or results couldn't be obtained for the other two, then you would have, still have a match, but you may not have as uh, highly discriminating of a match as you would if you had five locations. So it's like it's happening again. It's happening again where it's like, okay, every, he's, he li he's right here by these girls' campsites, but the shoe print doesn't match. And so that's why this has been unsolved. Nobody wrote, but I think he did it. I think if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. I mean, you can only have so many coinky dinks in one situation before, gosh darn it, you know. I think he did it. You know, I really think he did it. And I think he left that note too, that he was going to do that because I think that he was probably a sick, sick man. I mean, he was hiding out for four years. I mean, what else was he going to do with his life? I mean, what was he going to do? Go on to be a lawyer or a doctor at this point? I mean, a lot of the times, and we see this if we study the psychology and a guys, I'm obviously not a professional. I'm just a commentator talking to you guys, but... A lot of the time we see with these cases that these people that act on these urges, one, they've had the urges for a long time and then they finally act. And two, once they act, they have to act again. 
they have to commit these types of things again. They, they Maybe they can suppress it for a while, for a few years. If you guys watch my video on the Golden State Killer who did this for decades, he got away with this for, and he was a cop. He was an investigator going to these crime scenes and he was the one that did it. I mean, that's some creepy stuff. And I think that stuff still goes on today, but whatever. Because people are people no matter the time frame. I think we've been able to see with going over these cases that once they quench that thirst one time, they have to do it again. And I think he did it. That's who I think did it. And also, these families obviously have never gotten over it. And this is the part that I wanted to talk about because as a mother, you guys, can you imagine talking your child into going off to camp for all the right reasons, okay? Your child begs and says, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And you're like, you're trying to teach them to be independent and to, you know, go have fun, go be with the girls. And then this happens like, man, I hope these families, I hope these families get, you know, have healed I've seen videos and they seem like they've tried to, they're trying, but you know, that hole will always be there. I know that Lori's family ended up suing Camp Scott or the Girl Scouts for $5 million over the whole note situation. I know for me as a parent, I would be 38 hot. I would be heated if they did not tell me that somebody left a note, prank or no prank, saying that they were gonna kill all the girls in one tent and they did, okay? Hello, I, those are, I, that's something I'd like to know. You know, if somebody calls up to my kid's school and says that there's they're gonna, like, the next day, and you have school and you don't let none of the parents know, um, okay, I wanna know that, right, don't you? Also, the last thing I wanted to re-bring up that I thought was creepy, or not creepy, but eerie or a dink dink or whatever, was the little sister, Doris's little sister, five-year-old sister, who asked her mom what happens when people die, and her mom was explaining it to her, and then she said, Mommy, everybody's going to die tomorrow, and everybody in that tent did die the next day. Like, then imagine after that, if that little girl told you anything, she'd be like, Mommy, you know don't go to the store, you know, there could be a car. So I'd be like, okay, oh, we ain't going to the store. You know, like, have y'all heard about this? What do you think? Who do you think did it? Do you think that Gene was set up? Do you think that it was a big ploy? Do you think that it was a cop that was involved? Do you think that it was that farmer? Who do you think it was? Let me know in the comment section down below. Other than that, you guys, I hope y'all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I love you guys. Hug your families. Get outside. Get some sunshine this weekend. Go sit on the back porch. Go to the park. I love you guys, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. We are, we are dreaming in the dark. We are nothing more than dust.